Welcome to High Ridge Church. Here at High Ridge, we are a family of churches, and our hope is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. In the seat back in front of you, there are four cards. The card labeled New Here will give you more information about High Ridge Church and how you can get involved or join us in one of our groups. The communication card lets us know that you were here. We hope you leave High Ridge Church strengthened and encouraged. Even if this is not your first time here, the communication card is our way of starting a conversation. If you have any prayer requests, questions about ministries, or want to sign up for Pastor Jeff's awesome weekly encouragement, please fill out one of these cards and drop it in the offering containers or boxes by the exit doors. At the end of every service, there will be an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you make this important decision today or have ever done this before, we highly encourage you to drop a response card in the boxes by the doors as you leave. We want to help you take your next step with Christ. You can always give online at highridgechurch.com or on the High Ridge app. If you prefer cash or check, the giving envelope is located in the seat back in front of you. Thank you so much for your generosity. We have a lot of things going on at High Ridge Church. You might hear something on the platform, in passing, or maybe you have no idea what's going on. The best way for you to get details you need for every event or ministry at our church is on highridgechurch.com or by downloading the High Ridge app from the App Store or Google Play. Or you can always connect with someone at the Information Center in the lobby. We encourage you to lean in with anticipation for what God is going to do this weekend in your life. Thank you for joining us at High Ridge Church. Hey, hey. Have a, oh, thanks. Yeah, it's a big weekend for me. It's my birthday today. And I go, cool? yeah, it's my birthday. Preaching on my birthday. It's kind of a big birthday too. It's one of those milestone birthdays, you know? It's one of those birthdays that when you're younger, you look at it and you're like, when I get there, I'm gonna be really, really old. It's like official, official old. So I'm 27 today. Congrats to me, right? It's awesome. Plus a one and a three. So. Excited to be here with you today. My name's Andrew. Uh, I was on staff here at High Ridge for the last 13 years, and, and most recently, God has led my family and I, and, and we're, we launched a ministry a couple of years ago called Hope Fort Worth, and we get to travel now and speak to other churches in our area about God's heart for the weak and vulnerable and for the orphan and for children that are in the foster care system. And it's an awesome privilege. God's been blessing it. It comes with one drawback. I miss you guys. I miss you guys. I don't, we don't get to be here as much as we used to. You know the saying like when you're dating somebody and you say, you know, you don't want to date anymore. So you're like, it's not you, it's me. Well, that's how I feel because I'll see somebody around a town or a church. I'm like, I haven't seen you in forever. Where? Oh, it's not you. It's me. I'm the one missing. But no, we still love High Ridge. Love you guys. We're here as often as we can be. Uh, but frequently we're out in the community. And so when we do come here, it's our joy and privilege because you guys are really good looking and you're the best looking church in the Metroplex. And it's great to be here with you. Hey, I want us to keep praying for our pastor, okay? Uh, just by way of update, uh, there's been some improvement. Pastor Jeff is doing better. His, uh, his blood work is coming back cleaner than it has been before. And his kidneys are starting to pick up a little bit. So praise God for that. But also let's continue to pray for his kidneys to be 100% healed and restored and for them to function properly. And also just for his own strength and endurance and and for him and Pastor Don. You know, anytime you're going through an extended illness, it's just not fun. And it has a tendency to drain the life out of you and beat you. So we're gonna pray for them that that God would restore that to them, that their joy would be full and that they would be full of strength and life and vigor and vitality, Amen? amen? All right, well, right now at High Ridge, we're, one of our themes is knowing God. So what does it mean to, to know God? How, how can he be known? What's he like? What's he not like? And while we, we believe the scripture's clear that there is only one way to God, that, that's the gospel. It tells us that we, you know, as human beings, God created us. We had relationship with him. Our sin messed that up and caused a chasm between God and man. And then God in his mercy sent Jesus uh, to be the replacement for our sin, to take the place of our sin for us and die on a cross for us. And because of that, after he was dead, he was raised to life. And now we have eternal life through Jesus when we put our faith and our trust in him. That's the good news of the gospel. So there's only one path to God, but all throughout the course of human history, God has been revealing himself to mankind so that we could know him. And he reveals himself in, in lots of different ways. Uh, for instance, there's, there's two basic types of revelation. When we're talking about God revealing himself, himself there's two uh, basic types of revelation. There's general revelation, and then there's special revelation. General revelation is things that we can experience on our own outside of a supernatural thing that God does. So 
Things like uh, our conscience. The Bible tells us that our conscience bears witness to the fact that there is a creator. In fact, the scripture says that, that those who, uh, who ignore their conscience have no excuse before God because God's given them a conscience so that they could know God. Uh, nature itself, in Psalms 19, it says that nature, the heavens declare the glory of God. Our reason, our, our, the fact that we have logic and we can look at what is made in the created order and deduce from there that there has to be a higher power and intelligent design behind it. It's the whole watch versus watchmaker thing, right? So if there is a watch, then guess what there also is? A watchmaker. The watch did not appear and put itself together. Someone had to put this watch together. And we take that same approach to looking at our universe and our world and say, hey, in order for all of this complexity to work together, there was somebody, somebody transcendent above all of it, a design behind it. And even morality. The fact that there is any sense of moral code in our world at all points to there being some objective being that exists who says things are either right or wrong. Otherwise, our conscience would have nothing to feel bad about when we broke that moral code. And even those who are unregenerate and not in Christ have some sense of that right or wrong, and that comes from God. So there's that general revelation that can be seen regardless of, of where you're at, regardless of who you are. But the second category there is special revelation. And if we we're going to kind of explain what is special revelation, we'd say it's like this. It's, it's when God speaks. It's when God reveals himself specifically and makes, him known, makes himself known in a very real and tangible and supernatural and powerful way. It's, it's when God intersects time and space and shows up and reveals something about himself to somebody. And so things like uh, just incredible miracles in the Bible that happen, you know, the sun standing still and, and Jonah being swallowed and spit out three days later. And things like that are evidence of God's revelation to mankind, special revelation. But there's also dreams and visions and, and prophecy and all these different ways. Even the fact that right now through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can go to the Lord in prayer and he can whisper something to your heart is a form of special revelation. But out of all the different types of revelation, there is one that stands out to us as believers that's, that's very unique and special. It doesn't take the place of any other form of revelation, but is the standard to which everything else is subject. Without it, you and I are adrift. Without it, we are major league prone to mess up. We're prone to error. Without it, we would not even have solid footing to base our judgments of other types of revelation on. And this specific special type of revelation, it contains the words of prophets and apostles and, and teachers. It contains the words of Jesus himself. Of course, it's this book right here, the word of God. The most special type of revelation that was ever given to us from the Lord. This is the starting point for our teaching today. And this is the first thing I want you to grab hold of. To know God, you have to know his word. You can't, God cannot be known in his fullness apart from us knowing the word of God. We have to be people of the book. That's one of the ancient names for the Bible is the book. Capital T-H-E, book. The book. And the Bible is actually a collection. It's not just one book. It's a collection of 66 different books. There's 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament that make up the 66 books of the Bible. The Old Testament has literature in it like the Pentateuch, the first five books uh, of the Bible that are written by Moses. There's historical narrative uh, that, that tells these sweeping epic stories. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, what I like to call the good stuff. It's easy to read and people get killed and that's fun. Sorry, I'm a guy. I like that stuff. Is there fights? Sweet, I'll read about it. So you've got these books of history. You've got wisdom literature like, like Proverbs uh, and, and, and the Psalms. You've got prophecy. You've got these messages that, that are written down that the prophets in the Old Testament deliver to God's people. Uh, then you've got, in the New Testament, you've got the Gospels, 
the four accounts, historical accounts of the life of Jesus. In the book of Acts, where Jesus ascends into heaven and now the church is formed. And then you've got the epistles, which are these letters that the apostles wrote to the, their churches. So in the Old Testament, a prophet would receive a word and give it to the children of Israel. Now in the New Testament, the leaders of the church are writing these letters to the church and it's God's word to us today. And then of course we have the book of Revelation, which is its own deal. It's a little weird and crazy. Each one of these types of literature should be read differently. And the history books, like I said, they're easy to read. It's easy to get caught up in the story. It's interesting. It's exciting. The prophecy stuff, a little more challenging. Anybody dug into Jeremiah lately? 60-something chapters. I mean, you, you need like a doctorate. Like you get in there and you're like, what in the world is he talking about? Or Ezekiel, and there's like these creatures and eyes, and there's all sorts of stuff going on. Some of that stuff's a little harder to understand. It takes a little more diligence and, and study. The epistles are great when you're, when you're a new believer because it's fairly straightforward. You can read a letter that someone wrote to the church and it's, it's very applicable to us today as New Testament believers. There's themes and ideas that the writer is trying to impart to the church. Wisdom literature is my favorite. It's the easiest of all to understand. Proverbs is probably the easiest book in the world to understand. Let me break it down for you. Here's what Proverbs does. It says, do this, don't do that. If you do this, you will be blessed. If you do that, life will stink. So don't do those things that make life stink. Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> you've got the Psalms, which, which by the way, if you've ever attempted to read straight through 150 Psalms, just stop it. That's not what they're there for. They're songs of praise. That would be like literally reading 150 song lyrics in order. Be a horrible way to spend a day. But they're a great way to take one and sing it to the Lord and worship through it and praise God in that moment and then read something else. It's the purpose of the Psalms is to worship from them. So you've got all these different types of literature, all these different types of books that, that are read in different ways. But the Bible's not just a collection of books and letters and stories that are nice to read and, and sometimes hard to understand. We believe that God's word is true, that it's right, that, that it is perfect. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's unlike any other book in the sense that the Holy Spirit specially inspired the writers so that they could scribe out what it was that God was saying that was gonna be preserved for all of human history. It's infallible, it's inerrant. It is the sole thing that we base our faith and practice on. There's a doctrine for this, it's called sola scriptura, which means essentially that it's by scripture alone. The Bible is the sole infallible rule for our faith and practice. Any other form of, reg of revelation is subject to its authority, which means if, if you hear somebody say, God told me this, it has to line up with this. It has to line up with God's word. And God inspired this, and not only did God inspire it, but he helped people throughout the course of human history to preserve the scripture exactly as he gave it 3,000, 4,000, 2,000 years ago. It's incredible the amount of care that went into preser preserving the scripture. In the Old Testament times, they had these, you know, these big scrolls and the scribes were tasked with transferring from one scroll to the next because just like anything, scrolls wear out and break, right? And so they would do this and one scribe would spend years transcribing an entire one book of the Bible, years of their life transcribing it, and then they had a group of people that would come along and examine it and make sure that it was 100% exactly what had been written on the previous skull, and if it had one error, one, after years of work, they'd throw it in the fire. Because they knew that it was God's word and they wanted to make sure that it was preserved perfectly. There's actually a test uh, for ancient literature, right? One of the tests for ancient literature to figure out, is it verifiable, is it true, is this accurate, is, is what's called the bibliography test. And it basically says, how well does the current copy that we have of this literature match up to the oldest manuscript of it that we can find, right? Well, if you were to take other ancient literature like Plato or Aristotle or Sophocles, Sophocles, Sophocles like, what is it? Socrates. No, not Socrates. There's another one, forget it. Anyway, <laughs> this is probably the service that's gonna be recorded, so you're welcome. <laughs> Sophocles, boom, got it. So you, you compare all that and, and an old manuscript, like if, if, uh, if Socrates or Sophocles wrote something, he would have somewhere in the range of one 
to 20 different manuscripts that were ancient that you could compare the current literature to. The New Testament alone has over 2,000 manuscripts that are thousands of years old that you can compare today's copy to. And the New Testament all by itself is 99.5% exactly the same as the Dead Sea Scrolls that were written 2,000 years ago. Because so much care has gone into it. And you're like, well, what about the 0.05%? I knew that Bible was fake. <laughs> of all of the 0.05% of things that are different, they're all spelling mistakes or style. That's it. Nothing that changes the content or the message at all. God has gone through such care through the power of the Holy Spirit to preserve his word. It is the most verifiable, truest document that's ever been written. It's the best-selling book of all time. And it's not just a good book. It is God's word to you and I. It's perfect. It's life. It's a lamp to our feet and a light into our, a light into our path. It's, it's living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's inspired. It guides us. It teaches us. It sustains us. It illuminates things for us. And it is the standard by which we live our life. So there's three things I want to I impart to you today as far as our, our value for God's word and, and why we need it. If we want to know God, why do we need God's word? So the three things, if you're taking notes, this is a good time to start. Number one, when we know God's word, we know his character. We know his character. We know what he's like. There's a passage in Exodus 33, and uh, it's describing uh, the children of Israel and their relationship with God. And the children of Israel, by the way, were like soupy, super, super whiny and, and ungrateful and, and you know, just constantly complaining. So God would give them the law. This is the very first time that God is, is writing out his law for mankind. It's actually being put you know, into stone and in tablets. And they have it written now for the first time in human history. And, and Moses would read the law to them and all of them would listen and they'd go, yay, God, we'll do it. And then 30 seconds later, they'd totally blow it. And then the law would come again, and they're like, yes, we've got this. And then the, the next chapter, they'd totally blow it again. And God is holy, and he can't be associated with sin. And so in this particular story here, which, by the way, when you're reading Scripture, one of the really important things to figure out is who am I in this story? A lot of times we'll read, you know, like David and Goliath, and we think like, I'm David. I'm beating the giant. No, no. No, you're the scared Israelite in the tent who needed a savior to come in to face your giants for you. And in the story of Moses, we're the whiny Israelites. We are. God provides everything we need all the time. And yet we're like, God, I'm hungry. I had a bad Chipotle experience this week. I was like, what's up, God? It's not fair. Chipotle is supposed to be awesome. It was not. So there's these whiny Israelites complaining about everything, messing up the second they hear God's commands. And Moses goes before the Lord and says, please, God, you have to go with us. You can't leave us alone on this journey. We're not going to make it without you. And then he says this, and it's really the first time in Scripture that anyone says this statement to God. So, and Moses says, if you're pleased with me, teach me your way so I may, what? Know you and continue to find favor with you. What Moses is saying here is, God, I want to know what you're like. If I'm going to go on this crazy long journey and deal with these whiny Israelites, teach me more. Tell me what you're like. I, I, I want to know you. And you know, the, the thing about the, the, the Bible is it reveals so much about God's character to us. And if you and I don't read God's words, here is what we will do. We will discover a God of our own choosing, which is not really God, which is actually an idol. And here's what I mean by that. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, my God would never, well, my God's a God of love, which means he wouldn't, guess what? You don't know God. You're choosing the attributes of God that you like and making a God of your own choosing. That's why it is so vitally critical that we read God's word because we have to know him. And the only way we can know him is to find out everything about what he's like. The fact that he is so far above. He's transcendent, he's unreachable, and yet he's near to the brokenhearted. He's infinite and he's vast and he can hardly be defined, and yet he's the friend that sticks closer than the brother and he's the one who leaves the 99. 
He's righteous and he's holy and he hates sin. And yet he makes himself full of mercy and compassion. He's slow to anger and rich in love. He's hard to understand and yet he makes himself known and chooses to reveal himself to us over and over and over again. And there's this tension that rests in who God is. Where on the one hand we go, I, I don't, he, he seems so angry at sin and yet he's so loving and compassionate. How does that work? And here's the deal, you and I are not wired that way. It's hard for us to understand that. But that is who God is and the only way that we can know that is by knowing his word. A.W. Tozer, one of this great theologian said, said this, he said, the way that we think about God is the most important thing about us. When we know God's word, we know his character, we know his, what he's like, and that shapes the way that we think about him. And that keeps us from overemphasizing one aspect of his nature and forgetting about something else. We, uh, there's a guy that used to be an elder here. His name was Joseph Rowe. Great guy, some of you might remember him. And uh, he, he's a good old boy from Louisiana. He was, he was comfortable in nature. And one day nature intruded into our building uh, in the form of a little snake that got in the lobby and wrapped itself around one of the fake trees that Pastor Tom put out there in the lobby 10 years ago. <laughs> and everybody was like, ah, snake! And Joseph walks over there, let me look at that snake. And he gets right up, he gets right up and he just stares the snake down. And then before, I mean, you could even blink, pow, he reached out and grabbed that snake by the na- back of the neck, you know, behind the head, and was just walking around the lobby, <laughs> look what I got. <laughs> you got me a snake. Guy was like in his 60s and he was like teasing the ladies with the snake. Yeah, I ain't gonna get you. <laughs> he would also ask you to punch him in the stomach all the time. I don't know what that was about. Anyway, <laughs> he didn't kill the snake, walked it out, threw it out, out there in the, in the grass so it could come afflict us another day. But somebody asked Joe one time, they said, Joe, what, how does this work? I don't understand this idea that there's this God who is who is focused on justice and, and righteousness and hates sin and, and even appears at times in scripture to be angry towards sin. And yet we hear that God is love and he's mercy and he's compassion. How does that, I don't, I don't get it, how does that work? And Joe said this, I thought it was incredibly wise. He said, there's enough scripture to scare the unrepentant heart in their sin, but also enough scripture to bring hope to those who are hurting and weak. If you're here today, your heart is turned away from the Lord and you're unrepentant, there's a measure where you should have fear of the Lord because he's righteous and holy and he requires holiness. But the good news for you and I is that holiness doesn't come from us, it comes from Jesus. And when we put on Christ, we are now a new creation and we can stand before that holy God who requires sinlessness because we've put on Jesus. And if you're here and your heart's broken for your sin, you can put on Christ and he can save you and you can stand before that holy God. Here's a question for us today. Does the way you think about God and his character line up with what the Bible says about who he is? Number two, everybody say number two. When we know God's word, we know his commands. When we know God's word, we know his commands. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commands. Jesus goes on in this passage to say, the one who keeps my commands is the one who loves me. And throughout John 14, if you want to go read through that, it's really important to Jesus that we're obedient to what he told us to do, to his commands. I have the uh, privilege and the pain of coaching Little League Baseball right now. (laughs) Been a pastor my entire adult life. I think Little League's harder. (laughs) It's it's crazy, man. Some of you parents out there, chill out. Your kid's not going to the show, all right? (laughs) Just relax. Just relax. I've been screamed at in the last four weeks by parents more than any church member ever got mad at me in the last 20 years. So at the beginning of the season, I get, a, I get this thick rule book because I've moved up. My son's moved up. We're in the minors now. We're in kid pitch. This is serious, right? I get this rule book and it's like this thick. You think I read that rule book? Nope. I found one page. Pitch count, all right, sweet. (laughs) That was it, I didn't read the rules, I didn't have time for that nonsense. And here's the thing, I looked at that book, it was really thick, and I knew I wasn't gonna understand it all. I mean, it was just really, it's, 
It's all this jargon. I don't get it. You know, I, I mean, I know baseball, but not that well. And then I thought, you know, the problem is too, is like, this is my first year coaching at this level. And these league officials asked me to coach because they think I'm a decent coach. But if I read through this book, then I'm gonna have to go ask somebody what all these rules mean. And then it's gonna be really obvious. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna look stupid and they're gonna think I'm a horrible coach. They're not gonna ask me to come back. So I didn't read the book. I'm pretty sure we lost two games because I don't know the rules. <laughs> pretty sure. <laughs> so a couple times, a couple times, another coach came up to me at the end of the game and was like, you know, uh, you could have done this there. I'm like, oh, and you would have won. That's, that's great. <laughs> book was thick. It's hard to understand. Didn't get it. It is really, really hard to obey something you don't know. If Jesus says, you love me by keeping my commands, how can you keep something that you don't know? There is no other way for us to show Jesus our love through our obedience than to know what he asks us to do so that we can do what he asks us to do. How many have been pulled over for speeding and you didn't know what the speed limit was? Anybody ever had that happen to you before? How'd the cop feel about that? Did it go good for you? I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I thought it was 65. And there's no signs. Whose responsibility is it to know what the speed limit is? It's yours. It's your responsibility. It's our responsibility to know the Lord's commands so that we can obey them and through our obedience show our love to God. I think one of the things that we think sometimes is that God has all these rules right? There's all these commands in scripture. And I, I get it. Sometimes I'm reading through, I'm like, that's a lot. I mean, dude, I don't know. That's a lot. It's a lot of commands. And we have this tendency to think God is like, he's just, he doesn't like us. He's mean. You know, he's trying to, he's like out to get us. That is the most sophomore childish attitude we can ever have towards the Lord. It really is. And, and I, you know how I know that? Because I know that you as a parent wouldn't take that from your own child. Because you know, as a parent, that the rules that you put in place for your children are not for their harm, but for their joy. Because you're looking out for their best interests, and you know that if they go down A, B, or C path, that it will not end well for them. And that the things that they think are going to bring them joy are actually the things that are going to lead them towards death and destruction. And that's the whole purpose of God's command, is because he knows what is best for us. He knows what is ultimately for our joy. And he wants that for us. My, my little girl, Rachel, well, she's not little. She's like 13 going on 30 now, but you know. She, uh, when she was little, she really loved uh, electric sockets. They were her favorite. And so she would crawl around and go in search of them. And we, you know, here's the thing, our parenting style, we, we're not the, like, we didn't put locks on anything, okay? Uh, because we felt like it would be better to teach them boundaries than to save them from all that stuff, right? So we, we just... We would watch them instead. That's, it's a parenting tool. You can watch your kids. Um, I don't know. You just try it. You might try it. And so, so we didn't put any locks on anything. We didn't put the guards on the electric outlets. And, and when she would go to reach for the outlet, we would just pop her real lightly on the hand, not to hurt her, but just to startle her, right? Why? Because I'm mean and I like hitting little two-year-olds on the hand. No, because I don't want fried Rachel, right? I, I want... <laughs> I want her to grow up beyond two years old. And I know that if she sticks her finger in the, in the socket, it's not gonna go well for her, and I would rather her be startled by some light correction than suffer harm. And the Lord loves you enough to startle you with light correction and, and commands in his scripture that causes you to step back and take an account for what you're doing with your life than allow you to walk down a path of destruction. And he does it because he loves you and he does it for your joy. So embrace it like a son and a daughter instead of rebelling against it. So the question is, do you know God's word well enough to know his commands? Number three, when we know God's word, we know his will. We know his will. Romans 12, one and two says this. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. 
This is your spiritual act of worship. The scripture tells us that it is right for us to submit our lives and our, our will and everything that we have to the Lord because that's part of our worship. Say, Lord, I'm not my own, I'm yours. You bought me with a price, therefore I live for you and I live according to your ways. In verse two, it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How is our mind renewed? Well, our mind is renewed as we read God's word and understand his character and his ways, and it changes the way that we think towards life and everything. It changes our worldview. Rather than, than conforming to the way that the world says we ought to live and the way we ought to think, we allow this to dictate the way that we think about life. That's how our mind is renewed. Then he says this, then, somebody say then. Yes. When you've known God's word and allowed it to transform your life, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How many of you want to know God's will for your life? We all wanna know God's will for our life. Guess what? You already know what God's will is for your life. It's here. It's in the word of God. I think sometimes when we, we're, we're guilty of, of praying, God, show me. Show me your will for your life. Reveal yourself to me. Tell me what I'm supposed to do next. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we're not wanting to follow the Lord, we're wanting a crystal ball that's gonna tell us everything about our future. And the problem with that is, if you know everything that's coming in the next 30, 40 years, you're not gonna walk with the Lord to trust him to take you where he needs to take you. It's a walk of faith. That's what this walk is. Now, there are times when God intercepts and he reveals something to you and he, he shares, and those are awesome when God says, hey, here's the path I have, I want you to go pursue this, and it's something specific, and, and you get a glimpse of that future, that's incredible. But in the meantime, guess what? There is a whole bunch of stuff in your Bible that you can do, and you do not have to ask God if it's okay to do it. You don't have to ask God if it's his will, and you don't have to pray about it. That's the biggest Christian cop-out in the world. Somebody asks you to do something, I'm gonna pray about it. You know what that means? No. <laughs> Just gonna pray about it and seek the Lord. Here's some things you do not have to pray about. Here's some things you don't have to ask the Lord whether this is his will or not. You don't have to ask God's will, God, if it's his will to share your faith with your friends and family. You don't have to ask God if it's his will for you to, to help others grow in their walk with Christ once they do know Christ, to help disciple another brother and sister in Christ and lead them forward in the Lord. You don't have to ask the Lord if it's his will or desire for you to care for the orphan or the widow. It's explicit in scripture that we're commanded to do so. You don't have to ask the Lord if it's his will for you to give, for you to serve, for you to love people, for you to forgive people. If you're asking the Lord, Lord, should I forgive that person? The answer is yes. Why do we know that? Because it's in this word. God has already revealed his will to us, his expressed will in his word. And I wanna share something with you right now. When you submit your life to the express will of God in the word, then God will be faithful to reveal the more specific things to you down the road. But it doesn't work the other way around. We don't get to, we don't get to hold the Lord out there like some crystal ball and say, Lord, show me my future. We get to be obedient, listen to what he says, and follow him and take those steps of faith. And then he lays our path out for us. And it is so much better and pure that way because then, by the way, you know that God was the one that was leading you and it wasn't you that did it in your own strength. But it only happens when you know his word and you submit your life to him and then his, word, his will is made manifest through your life. And as we get ready to head out today, I know one of the things when we talk about knowing the word of God that, that comes up frequently is like, well, pastor, it, it is, it's confusing sometimes to read the Bible. I don't always understand it. I, I, don't, I don't always get it. There's these passages that don't make a lot of sense to me. There's a story about um, philosophers. We are talking about them earlier. Socrates, not Sophocles. And those are two different people. Please go look it up. I am right. Socrates uh, had a man come up to him one day, and uh, this may be urgent, urban legend, myth, it's a story, it's old. Man walks up to him and says, hey, how do I gain knowledge and wisdom? What do I do? How do I acquire it? And Socrates says, follow me. Starts walking towards this large body of water and just walks right, Socrates just walks right into the lake, so, come on, come with me. And he gets ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, chest deep, Right about the time they get to where the water is up to his neck, Socrates grabs the guy and holds him under the water. 
And the guy's thrashing away and he's just holding him down there. And finally Socrates lets him up and the guy's sputtering, he's angry. Why would you do that to me? You tried to kill me. Socrates says, no, I wouldn't, didn't try to kill you. If I'd killed you, I would've held you under for three more seconds, you know? The guy says, why did you do that? And Socrates looked at him and said, when you want knowledge as bad as you wanted that next breath, you'll get it. Our problem with knowing God's word and subsequently knowing God is not that it's too hard because you know what? When you want something bad enough, you'll figure out a way to get it. You'll figure out a way to find it. The Bible says that, that those who seek the Lord will find him. So go after him, pursue him, desire to know him, desire to dig into his word, find life in it. You know, if, if, if you're looking at that thick rule book and you're like, I don't get it, this is Greek to me, then guess what? Humble yourself and ask somebody else for help. Go to Mardell's and buy a study Bible. Join a small group. Ask a pastor. Ask someone else that you know that you think might know God's word better than you. Say, hey, I was reading this and it didn't really make sense to me. Make a list of questions. Go find a website that's solid. There's some bad ones, but ask. Just ask first, okay? <laughs> if you desire it, you will find it. And that's a promise from the word of God for you. Let me pray for you this morning. Thank you, Lord. Lord, as always, I just want to thank you because your word is good and true and it's rich and right. We are grateful, Lord, that you gave us the Bible. It's your gift to us. It's your message to us. And I thank you, Lord, that we can stand under its authority and live our life according to the word of God. And we know that when we do that, we are living according to your will. So we thank you for that, Lord. What a precious gift you've given us in your word. Lord, I pray for every uh, person that's here today that's desiring to know you better, to know you more and to know your word. And I pray that you would increase their desire to know your word and to love your word, to follow its commands, to learn about your character, to know your will for their lives, Lord, by living under its authority. I thank you, Lord, that your word promises that when we desire it, when we seek after it, you will let yourself be found by us. So thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that beautiful promise in your scripture.